Amen. That's good singing. Let's bow in prayer and let's seek the Lord's face again this evening as we come into his presence. Father, we thank thee again for another gospel service. We thank thee for your presence with us today already in the morning service and then in the open air this afternoon. We thank thee for thy word that has gone forth. And yet, Lord, we cannot depend upon past blessings, not even the blessings of this morning. We need thee to come afresh. And we pray, Lord, that you would meet with us this evening again. We thank thee for the promise that where two or three are gathered together in thy name. There thou art in the midst, and not to bless. And we pray, Lord, as the message of the gospel goes forth tonight, in word, in song, and in testimony, that you would be pleased, Lord, to bless thy word. Hide man far behind the cross. That would be our prayer tonight, that none would be seen save Jesus only. We pray, Lord, that everything that's said and done tonight would uplift and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank Thee, Lord, so much for saving our souls, those of us who are saved. We praise Thee, Lord, for that day when You reached down and plucked us as a brand from the burning. And Lord, we pray for those in the meeting tonight, those listening on who are still unsaved. We pray, Lord, that You would speak to their hearts tonight. And, O God, that You would save them for time and for eternity. We pray for those that are backslidden. Lord, you know the heart. Man looks in the outward appearance, but God searches the heart. Oh, God, search hearts tonight. And Lord, for us all, we all need that fresh touch from thee. Oh, God, we pray that you'll revive each and every one of us this evening, that we might know the hand of God upon us, even, Lord, as we would serve thee tonight. Fill us with thy gracious Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless are coming together this evening for us in Jesus precious precious name we ask it amen now it is good to see you all in God's house tonight we do welcome you give you a very warm welcome and we pray that the Lord will bless us we're delighted to have uh, Jenny and Raymond with us again this evening you're very welcome the whole way from County Fermanagh uh, beyond in a skill and we welcome them here tonight they're going to come and bring us their first couple of messages and so thank you Yeah. 
Please take your hymn book again, and we'll sing another hymn. I'd like to thank Raymond and Jenny for coming along tonight. We'll be hearing from them just in a few moments' time. The hymn is 225, but just before we sing the hymn, just let me make a few announcements. First of all, could I welcome you all here tonight again? It's encouraging to see so many in the meeting tonight, and we do welcome you uh, sincerely in the Savior's name, and especially if you're visiting. Just a few announcements uh, for our own congregation. Do remember the, the prayer meeting on Tuesday night at 8 p.m., and for a few Tuesday nights before we go on holiday, as we announced this morning, we'll be considering the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, do remember that immediately after this service tonight, we're observing the Lord's table. And the Lord's table, of course, is for the Lord's people. So God's people, do please remember to remember the Lord's death in His appointed way immediately after this service this evening. Then the service is next Lord's Day, as usual, 11.30 and 6.30 p.m., preceded by the half hour of prayer. And the Reverend Baxter will be here to preach at both services next Lord's Day. And the Wilson sisters will be here next Sunday night to sing in the gospel. And then Sunday, the 10th of July, we're having a, a special testimony meeting again. Our sister, Mrs. Margaret Beatty, will be coming along to give her testimony that, that Sunday evening. So do keep that in mind and pray for Margaret and pray for that meeting. Just to remind you again of the Holiday Bible Club from the 8th to the 11th, there is a list at the door. Again, let me remind you about it if you can help. And we want and need as much help as possible to sit with the children, to go on the buses, and to help in the meetings. Uh, so if you can help, please put your name down in that sheet. Uh, that's very much uh, appreciated. All those who have done so far, but we need more. So please take the time to do that even this evening. The Senior Citizens Outing is Saturday the 20th of August. Again, there's a list at the door. Put your name on the list and fill in the menu uh, please. I think that's all the announcements I'll make at this stage. We want to stand. That singing's really, really good. Noel, Noel has got you into good singing form. So let's stand again to sing this hymn. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin as he knocks and asks admission. Sinner, will you let him in? We'll sing the first three verses only. The first three verses only, standing to sing.
ask Raymond and Jenny to come and bring us another message and song. to thank again Raymond and Jenny for coming along tonight singing to us and may the Lord bless those lovely hymns to all of our hearts. Now I'm going to ask Darren to come now and he's going to give us a word of testimony. If you can turn your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> and while you're finding a place, just want to thank Reverend Gray for inviting me along tonight. I don't really want to thank him at all, to be honest with you. But, um, I've known him for a while now, so I have to, couldn't really say no. And uh, I learned very quickly when you get married that if you don't want to do a job twice, you do it badly the first time. So you might not ask me for a while after the night. But I just want to read from verse 11 down to verse 24. That's very familiar. It's the, it's the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. It says in the word of God, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, 
there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. With that portion of scripture before us, I just want to have a quick word of prayer unto the Lord tonight. Dear Lord and loving Heavenly Father, as we come before thee in, and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, we come before thee, O Lord. And I ask thee, O Lord, to bless this short, brief word of testimony, Lord, even to the hearts, Lord, of thy people here tonight, Lord, and of the unsaved, Lord, and even of the backslidden, Lord. And we pray, O Lord, that you will, Lord, take up these feeble words, Lord, and use them even unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> um, just another couple of wee verses that I just want to start off with, Romans 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 10, verse 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I want to thank the Lord that I have a testimony to give tonight, and for his saving and keeping power, otherwise I wouldn't be able to stand up here tonight and tell a very brief account of my life and how the Lord saved me. Like many here, like many everywhere, I suppose, throughout Northern Ireland, I was born into a Christian home. I'm the second oldest of five children, two brothers and two sisters. And I was uh, brought up by two Christian parents. Uh, both my parents knew and loved the Lord, although they too, at some point in their lives, had to ask the Lord to save them. Being brought up in a Christian home didn't save me didn't get me into heaven, but it did mean that I was, there's, there's not much, I don't think there's any time in my life I didn't really know that I needed to be saved. <clears throat> my first memory as a child, I'm pretty sure, was at the age of three. I've sort of went through my memories, and this is the first one I can think of, and that was of, of kneeling down with my mum and asking the Lord to save me at a very, very young age. I was very young. Some might say I was too young even to understand. But I believe I was saved that day, and I believe that that profession of faith stayed with me my whole life. You know, it says in Mark chapter 10, Suffer the little children to come on to me and forbid them not. And the gospel is simple enough for even a child to understand. In fact, we are to come to the Lord with a childlike faith. And we thank you, and we thank the Lord, sorry, tonight, that the gospel is for all ages and not just for the old. Like many who were brought up in a Christian home, I was sent faithfully to church. I sent to Sunday school and children's meetings, prayer meetings, youth fellowships, Friday night meetings, Thursday night meetings. I was sent everywhere that there was a meeting on, we were sent to go along and we had to go and there was no arguing about going you just had to go and that was it um, I also went to a Christian school I wrote I've wrote down here I've had the privilege of attending it was a privilege it was a Christian school but I didn't really see school as a privilege at the time I hated school and everything about school um, probably regret that one now but it just meant I grew up with Christian friends and, and Christian teachers I actually met my wife at school it wasn't all bad then, you know. But uh, we, were, we didn't marry her when I was at school, like obviously. But <laughs> I met her at school. Yeah. Although I had to save at a young age, as many children do, 
I just sauntered and drifted along in my Christian life. I had no real major problems or struggles. You know, when I was young, my, my friends were saved. I never really had to stand up for my faith. They all believed the same as I believed. They never questioned anything I would have said. It was, it was, it was easy enough to, to, just, to just saunter on and blend in with everybody else. Um, I was just like any other kid. I had my interest. I loved playing football. I loved playing with my friends. I hated school. Um, I knew what I wanted to do from a young enough age. I, didn't, I knew what I wanted to do when I left school, so I didn't have any ambitions or plans to do A-levels or go to university or anything like that. Um, but at the age of 16, I had a decision to make regarding school and what I was going to do, and we decided to go on to the training centre in Enniskillen. We had moved up to Enniskillen at this point, I should say. Father was a minister there, as you, as you know. That's where you snatched him from. But uh, so I went. I, I decided to, to become a joiner, um, and it was a very different experience for me than being in school. I can tell you, and being in a Christian school at that, this is my probably a first time I'd ever been around a lot of people who were unsaved and didn't even know or acknowledge anything about God. Um, it was it opened my eyes really to. To what I was up against in, in, in the well in the future really but even then the Lord is he did have his hand upon me and I believe the Lord looked after me he sent me one one friend that I already knew from a previous school a Christian friend and he went to tack with me and uh, he was a real help to me and we were help to each other sort of stood up for each other like uh, to my shame uh, I can't remember a time I really told anybody or witnessed for the Lord, but they knew we were different. They knew we didn't do the things they'd done. But the Lord has looked after me my whole life. He's, there's been a few times we've had car accidents and accidents at work and different things like that, and the Lord, he has looked after me and brought me through that. At the age of 20, I'm skipping through quickly here, but at the age of 20, I started to pull away from God. And after everything that the Lord had done for me, I started to get a taste for the world. And I remember taking my first drink of alcohol. I remember smoking my first cigarette. I remember thinking at the time, it's only one. It'll not go anywhere. So it's only money trying it. But it was the start of a, of a slippery slope for, for me, unfortunately, one drink led to another, and another, and another, and the same with the cigarettes, I found myself quite addicted to them. I remember constantly lying to my parents, sneaking out to pubs and clubs, and sneaking around the back of the house for smokes, and just, it was the start of a real slippery slope in my life, and, and I was going down quickly, and I was dragging friends down with me. Um, when I turned 23, we and a couple of fellas decided we'd leave Northern Ireland all together and do a bit of travelling, see some of the world, and maybe work overseas. We decided to go to Australia for a few years. Um, so we got up the money, and we were, it was an exciting time for us to move away and experience new things. Um, I can't say that in my heart of hearts, I, I knew that it wouldn't bring me any closer to the Lord. It would draw me further away from the Lord and furthermore into sin. And in my heart, there was a worry of that, but it didn't stop me from going. You know, sin will bring you further than you want to go. And uh, we decided to go off, I think it was January or February time, in 2010, we, we headed off to Australia. And during our, the time there, we, well, we lived, well, I, I, I was there for, I think, about nearly two years, and I just lived like the prodigal son in this story in a foreign land. I lived for myself and for the pleasures of the world. We traveled for a while, and then after a few months, we sort of ran out of money, and we 
between the four of us, we bought a van and drove from Melbourne to Alice Springs into the middle of nowhere. St straight drive for oh, thousands of kilometers. And we got there and we, we got jobs and we settled in there for a few, well, about a year, a year and a half. But always in the back of my mind, I was always aware that I was doing the wrong thing. And I didn't feel comfortable, really any, there was always this niggling in the back of my mind that I shouldn't be here and I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And the Lord always kept pulling me in that sort of direction. He kept reminding me that I was saved, that I was a child of his. And I used to wake up in the middle of the night and in the early mornings in a sweat and worrying. And I used to pray, not that the Lord would bring me back to himself, but the Lord would help me to sort myself out. I, I was, still wasn't willing to give myself back to the Lord. I was like this prodigal son. I was more willing to go and feed swine than I was to go back to the father's house. But I remember when I left, my mother had, had put a Bible, snuck a Bible into my, my bag, and I never really read that Bible when I was in Australia, but she left a wee note in it, and I used to read over it, and even looking at the Bible would have convicted me of my sin. And I knew I had parents and friends and family at home that were praying, praying hard for me. And I, we had one friend there who was with us. He stayed with us for a short time, but he was a Christian. And he couldn't really take the way we were living anymore. And he went off on his own to travel. And he was a great witness to me. He, he, would, he would have wrote me letters and, and texted me different things and witnessed to me. And the Lord definitely used that, I believe, to convict me even further. And I thank God that even when I was so far away, people were there to, to speak to me. And you, you were still witness to, and you felt the power of even the prayer back home. And a year and a half later, a year, I think it was a year and a half, a year and seven months, something like that, um, I decided I was going to come home. I knew there was, there was no way I was ever going to come back to the Lord out here but uh, in Australia. But I knew if I brought myself home, it would bring myself back into that environment where I would be back into the, the company of Christians and the company of those and back into church and it would help me because I didn't I didn't know that I needed to come back to the Lord but it's not something you just decide people think they can just decide at any time oh I, I live in sin for as long as I want and then I just decide to come back to the Lord I decide to get saved whenever it suits me it doesn't really work like that you need to accept the call of the Lord Second I returned home from Australia, I felt a huge burden had been lifted, and I started to attend meetings again, youth rallies, church. Sin still had a hold on me, though. I still was doing the things that I, I, I always done. But I was content just to be doing them, and, and, and yet being in the, the, pre, the sort of the atmosphere of church and youth rallies again, and, and my old friends, and living at home, and... But the Lord had different plans for me. And it was on the 9th of October 2011, we went to Ocknaclaw Youth Valley. There was a, a Keith Shields was testifying. And we had, we, he, he was a, I think he was a Northern Ireland strongman. And we decided to go along to hear him and to hear all about this Northern Ireland strongman and see what he got up to. But when we got there, what we were expecting to hear wasn't what he, he told. He, he told very little about his, his own life and about them antics he got up to. He, he glorified God in his testimony and he spoke of how the Lord saved him from a sinful life and how his life didn't have any happiness in it until he met the Lord. And um, I was only able to leave my seat that night. I stayed seated for a long time after the meeting ended until eventually like a mates dragged us away into the hall for something to eat. And I'd done nothing about that that night. But I was deeply convicted of my sin. It wasn't to the next night, however, whilst lying in bed, 
I was out, just I think I was out that night just visiting a mate and then we come home and I was just laying in my bed that my wife, well, she wasn't my wife at the time, she was only a friend at the time, she texted me a few verses and, and I'd read them and I came under deep conviction of sin and I just didn't feel I could put it off any longer. And like the prodigal again, I, I, I went and I seen my father and like, like a child of three again, I went and I sp- well, first of all, I spoke to my mum. You always go to your mum first, what well, I always did, and she buttered up your dad. But uh, I went to my mum and explained what I wanted. And I was a big fella, tw- 24, 25, and I was in tears. I was crying my eyes out. And dad came out, and like, like in this portion as well, he, he didn't pass any judgment on me. I, I, he didn't... He didn't tell me how bad I was or what I'd done or shouldn't have done this or shouldn't have done that. He just simply said that the Lord will forgive you for everything you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. And he, he pointed me to the scriptures once again and he led me back to the Lord that night. And I praise you and thank, praise and thank the Lord that I came back to the Lord that night and there was a big load and burden lifted off me. There was a, a difference straight away. I had been trying to give up the cigarettes for a long time for my own reasons, not, and I couldn't do it. And I never smoked one cigarette since that day or that evening, not one. And it, you know, it says in Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. And that night my sin was completely forgiven me. From that moment, as I said, the sins I found hard to give up were no longer had a hold on me, had a peace in my heart that I couldn't really explain. I don't believe I'd ever experienced it before because I was so young when I, when I got saved before. I didn't have any burdens or anything that needed, you know. I didn't, but I felt a real peace in my heart. And I began telling my friends, my own saved friends, that I become a Christian. I was no longer able to do those things that I used to do. You know, in Jeremiah 3, verse 22, it says, Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. And the Lord's promised to heal us. Now, it doesn't mean you have an easy, easy road or that you don't let the Lord down. Um, we've experienced many sufferings in our life as well, and through family, and we've experienced very many trials as well and we've lost loved ones there's times we've we've really needed to lean upon the Lord there's times we have drifted from the Lord and we shouldn't have but the Lord is always there to pull us back in and even when mum was sick there the Lord was really near our whole family and we do thank all of you as well for for the prayers that went up and we, we thank the Lord for the power of prayer but the Lord blessed me with a life I would say is worth living now. Um, we have a wee girl and all now there, so I'll keep taking, uses up a lot of her time. We're, we're st- I'm still doing the joinery, I'm still hacking away at something, but um, it, it's definitely, it's definitely, I, I don't have no regrets in my life. From that point on, I have a lot of regrets before that, but I do not regret asking the Lord to forgive me for my sins. And just say in closing, um, maybe there's someone here and you've wandered far from the Lord. Maybe um, you were once on fire for God. Maybe there's a sin or sins that are holding you back that you can't seem to give up. I would urge you tonight to return to your first love. The Lord has promised to heal you. And even if there's any here that's unsaved, just leave a wee verse of scripture with you. Solemn wee verse found in James 1 verse 15. And just the latter part of it, it says, And sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. You know, I pray that you'll turn from your sin tonight and seek Christ. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank Aaron for coming and sharing his testimony with us tonight. 
And I would just reiterate what he has been saying concerning if there's any young person or older person in the meeting tonight and you're a backslider. This, this seems to be the theme for today and this week, the backslider. But as Aaron quoted those words, thank God the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And whether you've been backslidden for a few years or 20 or 30 or 40 years or longer, Thank God the Lord will restore you to himself and you can have that sweet fellowship restored again with the Lord and he will bless your life again. The old devil, of course, will tell you, well, the Lord doesn't want you now because you're a failure. But thank God that's not the case. If the truth were told, we're all failures. But there's one who loves us and one who gave himself for us and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's willing to save you tonight, and He's willing to restore you if you're, if you're far away from Him, if you are a backslider this evening. May God bless our testimony to all of our hearts. Turn with me to John chapter 19, just for a few moments, and I'm just going to be brief tonight, just before we come to the Lord's table. And I do pray that God's people tonight will remember this day for the Lord's table. And remember the Lord's death in his appointed way. In this text of Scripture in John chapter 19, we are told about the death of Christ. And we're also told about the death of the two malefactors. But look what it says there in verse 33 of John chapter 19. It says, But when they came to Jesus... And saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. There we have recorded for us the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that's the wonderful message of the gospel. That's why Aaron was able to get up, and any of us are able to get up and give her testimony because of his death and because of his resurrection. And in a few moments' time, we as God's people will be gathering around the Lord's table to partake of the bread that reminds us of a body that was broken and wine that reminds us of blood that was shed. We'll be remembering the Lord's death in his appointed way. My friend, tonight, again, I want to remind you of the great love that the Lord Jesus Christ has demonstrated upon the cross for you and for me. We often sing that hymn, Oh, t'was love, t'was wondrous love, the love of God to me that brought my Savior from above to die on Calvary. Those of us who are saved tonight were saved because of the love and the mercy and the grace of a Savior. And thank God tonight, that's the wonderful Savior that we have to declare, that Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he died voluntarily. That simply means that he gave up his life, a ransom for the many. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. No one forced the Lord to go to the cross. No one put his arm up his back and made him go. But he left heaven's glory, came down into this sin-cursed world, and died willingly for your sins and for my sins. And not only did he die voluntarily, but he died vicariously. Now, that simply means that he died in the place of others. A vicarious sacrifice is a substitutionary sacrifice. Oh, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own, and he bore my sins to Calvary. And there he suffered, and he died alone. He became the sinner's substitute. Isn't that wonderful tonight? That because he has died and died in my place, thank God you and I can go free. We can have everlasting life. Our sins, which are many, are all forgiven through the precious blood of of the Lamb because of His substitutionary work upon the cross. 
And of course, he also died victoriously. In other words, he paid the price of man's salvation completely and forever. And as we have emphasized from this pulpit many, many times, he died according to the Scriptures. Because when the soldiers came to finish off Christ, to kill him, to break his legs, he was already dead. And when you read the rest of the passage here, you discover that they did not break the legs of the Savior because he had already given up the ghost. He had already died. He chose when he would die and when he would give up the ghost. Oh, what love. It's amazing love tonight. My friend, the Lord Jesus, when he died upon that middle tree on Golgotha's brow, he died to wash away our sins. Thank God for that. That's why he will receive the sinner tonight. That's why he will receive the backslider tonight. That's why he will receive you and me this evening. Nothing good that I have done. Simply to his cross I cling. And my friend, what you need to do tonight is to call upon him, just like Aaron did, just like I did, just like many in the meeting did. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and thank God you can call in faith and in repentance tonight and he will hear. Why? Because the work is done. The work is finished. And you tonight can make peace with God through the blood of his cross. Oh, here we see the death of the Savior. But also in this passage, and I want you to see this, take a look at verse 32. You'll see the death of the two malefactors. Look what it says. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, first malefactor and of the other, the second malefactor, which were crucified with him. Now, we all know the story of the two malefactors. One died and went to heaven. The other one died and was lost forever. When they were first crucified in the cross, they were both on their way to a lost eternity. But we know the story so well how one of them turned to the Lord in faith, and he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. In other words, he said, Lord, save me. He recognized that he was the sinner, realized that Jesus Christ, uh, the one that was hanging on the cross beside him, was the Savior, and he cried for mercy. And you remember what the Lord says, today shall thou be with me in paradise. The other man had no faith. He did not repent, and he was lost. He was lost. My friend, the question at the end of the meeting tonight is this, how will you die? Will you die as one who is saved and go to heaven, or will you die as one who is lost and go to a Christless eternity? My prayer is that you will die on your way to heaven, and you can tonight because of the death of the Son of God upon the middle tree on Golgotha's brow. I heard of a very sad incident this weekend. I wonder, did you hear about it? It happened in South Africa, in a place called, I think it was Little London, in a nightclub. It was either Friday night or Saturday night, in a nightclub. Twenty young people died in the one nightclub. They don't know at the moment what happened to them, whether they were on drugs whether there was something to do with a gas explosion, we don't know. But 20 young people from the age of 18 to 20 died in that one nightclub over the weekend. You know, I can just think of those young people earlier on that day looking forward to their night out. They were going to enjoy the pleasures of the world. They were going to enjoy the dance that night. And they were looking forward to it. They had, perhaps, the girls had bought new dresses. The boys were going to dress up as well. And they were so looking forward to their night's fun and pleasure. They never thought, never thought for one minute that before the dance was over, before the night was out, that 20 of them would be lying in that dance hall dead. Oh, sinner, this evening, we don't know what a day may bring forth. We make our plans, and there's nothing wrong with making plans, but if your plans are made without the Lord, 
then you're foolish. You make your plans. This week, and no doubt, young people, you're making your plans for the weekend again. Where's the weekend going to bring you? Oh, I pray that tonight that you'll be found in Christ, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. You're going to die, but make sure you die in Christ. And you can die in Christ because of the death of the Savior and because of the resurrection of the Son of God. You can know everlasting life. Oh, there's life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved, unto him who was nailed to the tree. Is there a backslider here tonight? Is there one like Aaron who was brought up in the gospel, brought up in a Christian home, made a profession of faith, and then got to a certain age and you're away from God tonight? And maybe you feel deep down in your heart that there's no way back. Maybe the old devil's whispering in your ear tonight. The Lord would never forgive you. Oh, look what sins you've committed. Look how far down the, the road of the backslider you've traveled. There's no forgiveness for you. He's a, he's a liar. The devil's a liar. Oh, thank God. The prodigal went far into the far country, deep into sin. He wasted his substance with riotous living. But then he came to himself and he thought of the father's house. And you know, the father was waiting for him. Indeed, the father was watching for him. Oh, dear backslider tonight, let me say it to you, the father, the heavenly father, he's waiting for you. He's watching for you because he loves you. And he'll forgive you for your backsliding. And he will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And he will take your life up again and he will use it in his service and for his glory. If you commit your life afresh to the Lord. The way to God, as we have said before, is the way of confession. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. And if we shall believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. We shall be saved. Only acknowledge your backsliding. Isn't that what Jeremiah told the people? Only acknowledge your backsliding and the Lord will receive you. Oh, sinner, those of you who are not saved, come to Christ tonight. Trust Him and He will redeem you. Let us all pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Your presence in the meeting tonight. We thank Thee, Lord, for undertaking we pray, Lord, tonight that you would bless every head bowed in your presence. Oh, God, you know the spiritual condition of all of our hearts. Man looks in the outward appearance. God searches the heart. Oh, God, I pray tonight for those who are not saved, that you would save them. I pray, oh, God, that you would reveal unto them your, your great love for them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And Lord, I pray for those who are backslidden. They're not walking in the place where they once walked. Oh God, show them that the Father's watching for them, wanting them and longing that they will come home just like the prodigal. Oh God, restore such tonight. And Lord, those of us who are seeking to walk with Thee, help us to walk with Thee. Lord, we confess that there are times in all of our lives when we grow cold. Lord, warm us up again. Set us in fire again. Send us a breath of revival again, we pray thee. Bless every home in our congregation here. Bless every home represented here in this church tonight, those listening on. And Lord, save our children, all of our children, all of our grandchildren, and all of our loved ones. Unite our families in Christ, Lord, we pray. And O oh God, we'll be very careful to give to thee the praise, the glory, and every bit of the honor for us in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Folks, God bless you. I'm not going to go to the door. Obviously, we're going to partake of the Lord's table now. But those who are not remaining are free to leave. But God bless you and safe home. <laughs>